For some among you, the name Vulcan will conjure mental images of Star Trek, with the name being that of the planet Spock calls home. For others, you'll know Vulcan as the Roman god of fire, volcanoes and blacksmiths. Now that's the incarnation of Vulcan we'll be looking at in this episode. He's often considered the equivalent of the Greek Hephaestus, and his worship dates to at least the 8th century BCE, as far as records go, when the Romans built him a shrine. He was an important god for the Romans, and like Silvanus and Juno, he was also important to ordinary people, not just the Roman state. So let's take a look at some of his myths and how people worshipped him in this week's episode of Fabulous Folklore. Hello there and welcome to Fabulous Folklore, the podcast for all things folklore, occult and just a bit weird. I'm your host, Icy Sedgwick, blogger, fantasy author and your guide into these rather mysterious realms. I've got some rare things to show you, so come on in, take a look around, but be careful not to touch anything. These things sometimes bite. Well, hello there. And welcome back to Fabulous Folklore with me, your host, AC Sedgwick. We are continuing Roman Deities Month, and it is quite interesting how a lot of these deities have ended up being important to the state, yes, but also really more important to ordinary people. And that seems to be the theme this time compared to some of the gods that we looked at the last time we did Roman Deities, when we did the likes of Jupiter and Mars. Now we are cracking on and we're going to have a look at Vulcan and I am quite a big fan of Vulcan and I think that he sometimes gets a little bit of a raw deal, much like Juno actually. We get a little bit more of a sense of nuance with Vulcan. So you may be wondering, okay this is all well and good but who was Vulcan? Well we can apparently trace his origins to Sethlands, an earlier Etruscan god of so-called beneficial fire as opposed to destructive fire and that is something that we'll see quite a lot in this episode, the fact that you've got sort of good fire as it were, which would obviously be the likes of cooking fires and forges and things like that where you can use the fire for something useful versus destructive fire which kind of, you know, it does what it says on the tin. Now this particular origins in an Etruscan god does make Vulcan one of Rome's oldest gods, and like I say, the shrine to Vulcan at the foot of the Capitoline Hill is one of Rome's oldest temples. Now, early Etruscan priests actually told the Romans to keep their Vulcan shrines outside city limits, and quite honestly, that makes a lot of sense when you consider ancient tendencies to build houses out of wood. Now, despite these Etruscan origins, in the Roman myths, Vulcan is the son of Jupiter and Juno, and he's the brother of Mars. And in one legend, recycled from the stories of Hephaestus in Greece, he was apparently rather ugly when he was born. Now, Juno was furious, and she doesn't come out of this story well, believing that her offspring with Jupiter would be as beautiful as Jupiter's children with the nymphs, and she actually threw Vulcan off the mountain altogether. Now, he broke his leg when he landed, and that never healed properly. Thetis the water nymph found him and raised him as her own and it seems that he actually had quite a nice time with Thetis and he eventually discovered a talent for making things using metal and fire and he made a beautiful silver necklace for his adoptive mother. When Juno saw it she obviously wanted to know who on earth has made this because it's fabulous and eventually Thetis had to come clean and admit it was Juno's own son who'd made it and Juno was apparently shocked to learn that it was actually her flesh and blood who had made the necklace. Now the gods did eventually welcome Vulcan back among them and his talent saw him forge weapons, armour, jewellery and various other important items for gods and heroes alike. And as an example, he apparently made Jupiter's lightning bolts and he also made Cupid's arrows. Vulcan even helped Jupiter birth Minerva from his own forehead using his tongues. That's Jupiter's forehead by the way, not Vulcan's. But it is also Vulcan who makes Pandora from clay. And yes, that's the same Pandora who opens the jar and unleashes evil into the world. Now, the myths often stress Vulcan's unappealing physical appearance, and yet he ended up with Venus as his wife. Now, this was not something Venus was particularly happy about, and it is worth having a look at the myth about them to explain how they ended up together. Now, before Vulcan returned to Olympus, he'd made a beautiful chair of gold for Juno. Now, he actually sent it to her as a gift, and she had no idea who'd sent it at first, and she was absolutely overjoyed with it. The problem was, when she sat in it, it actually set off a mechanism that trapped her in the chair, because Vulcan had never forgiven Juno for her rejection of him as an infant, and I kind of can't help thinking he's probably fair point there. 
But none of the gods could undo such mechanical trickery and eventually Jupiter promised Vulcan his choice of wife if he would just release Juno. And I can't help thinking Jupiter pretty much only did that because he wouldn't have heard the end of it otherwise. But anyway, even though everyone expected Venus and Mars to marry, Vulcan chose Venus. And it, it's a bit of a horrible thing the way she's essentially forced into this marriage with someone she's just not interested in because Jupiter is the only one who can make the gods do anything. So you do have to feel a little bit sorry for Venus. And it wasn't really a happy marriage and Vulcan had no children with Venus. Instead, however, Venus and Mars did continue their relationship behind Vulcan's back, who, let's remember, was actually Mars's half-brother. I say half-brother because of that myth that Mars was actually born from Juno without Jupiter's involvement, but either way, they were related. Now, according to the legend, whenever Vulcan found out that Venus had been unfaithful, he worked so hard at his forge beneath Mount Etna in Sicily that he created a volcanic eruption. Other people are a bit more charitable and they think that volcanic eruptions are simply Vulcan hard at work on his various commissions. And I kind of can't help thinking that's probably more likely. But I do just want to point out that the eruption of Mount Vesuvius that destroyed Pompeii and Herculaneum began on August 24th, AD 79, and that was the day after the Vulcanalia, which was Vulcan's festival. Also interesting to note that Venus was Pompeii's patron. Now, some writers on the subject have wondered if Vulcan was just simply dissatisfied with his sacrifices that year, or if maybe he just heard about Venus's infidelity again. Now, speaking of Vulcan and Venus, it's worth having a look at Vulcan's role as the armourer of the gods, because this actually appears as a plot point in the Aeneid. And in this, Venus asks Vulcan to make a shield for her son Aeneas, and this reflects the visit of Thetis in the Iliad to see Hephaestus and request divine armour for Achilles. So Sergio Casali notes that this is basically pointless of Venus because Aeneas doesn't actually need armour, whereas Achilles does in the Iliad. But the request of armour from Vulcan is basically a narrative device to conflate Aeneas with Achilles in the mind of the reader. Now, I did point out earlier that Venus and Vulcan had no children, so therefore Aeneas is not Vulcan's son. So Venus is essentially asking her husband to make armour to protect her son by another man, Anchises. Now, to be fair, Jupiter has actually made Venus fall in love with Anchises so that she can be the mother of Aeneas. So again, poor Venus is kind of getting pushed to do things by other people. But she does ultimately seduce Vulcan purely to get him to agree to make the shield. Now, a lot of the articles about this do stress the fact that Vulcan has no interest in making the shield until Venus offers herself as a reward. And therefore, people look quite unkindly on Vulcan as a result of that. But I think that the other thing that we can look at as part of this is Vulcan is basically often essentially an artist for hire, which also explains why he's the god of artisans. And he very much works on commission for others rather than producing the things that he wants to create. And if you want to do it, I'm pretty sure you could probably claim Vulcan as a god of freelancers as well. But it is worth bearing in mind that he, it does get cast in this role of people need something so they go to him and he makes it rather than him necessarily making something because it's what he wants to do. Now, in other works, he's a patron god of confectioners, bakers and cooks because they all use ovens. And Francis Bacon even drew parallels between Vulcan and alchemists. And when you think about the process of alchemy, it's very similar to things like blacksmithing, where you take one element, you apply things to it and you end up with something different. Now, obviously, in blacksmithing, you end up with something that's made of iron. The element itself doesn't change, but it's the general principle. So you can see why there would be that link between Vulcan and alchemy. So why is Vulcan important? Well, in some ways, he's an unusual figure among the gods because he's a lame god. Now, some people describe him simply as lame. Other people refer to a deformed leg. Other people, again, just refer to it as a broken leg that never healed properly. But either way, he does seem to limp around quite a lot in the myths. Although you do sort of look at a lot of the things that he makes and you're like, yeah, but look at him, he's awesome. And it does also make for quite an interesting depiction of disability among deities who are usually held to be perfect. And I think that, for me, is what makes Vulcan a little bit more relatable and, dare I say, a little bit more human in that he does have this. I'm not going to call it a flaw because it's not a flaw. It's just when you compare him to the other gods, he has something that marks him out as being unusual. It clearly doesn't stop him from doing any of the amazing things that he does, but it does mark him as being different. And there is a belief that the other gods treat him more like a servant because of his bad leg, which is obviously a really, really awful move on their part. That said, there is a suggestion that his 
and I don't I don't really call it deformity, but that's what the writers refer to it as. There is a suggestion that that has a foundation in historical practice because it is believed that people would train slaves to be smiths, but then they would maim them so that they couldn't actually escape. And as a result, people would then come to associate blacksmiths in particular with deformity. So naturally, Vulcan would be lame as well. So we have to wonder if that is indeed true, because obviously who came first, like her faces and Vulcan or that particular practice? I don't know. Now, Vulcan is usually depicted with a beard, so he's kind of, I guess, a man sort of anywhere between like his early 30s and late 40s kind of thing. And he usually either wears a hat and a tunic that's tied at one shoulder, leaving the other shoulder bare, or he's naked except for an animal skin tied around his waist. Now, figurines of Vulcan have also been found in Britain, demonstrating that the Romans obviously found Vulcan helpful enough to carry to the edges of the empire. And in terms of his pose, he's often sort of just standing with one arm raised, which obviously would have held a hammer at some stage. So he's always depicted kind of in the middle of what he's actually known for, which makes him a lot easier to spot among. A lot of the other gods do look really similar to the extent there's actually a statue in the British Museum where they're not sure if it's Jupiter or Neptune because it could literally be either of them but it's a lot easier to spot someone like Vulcan because he's usually depicted with the tools of his trade. Now we've obviously talked about why he's important but how did people worship him? Obviously people would have worshipped him in their own way probably you know through their own work and so on but the main thing that he's famous for is the Vulcanalia which is his big festival which falls in August and that falls on August 23rd. Now, the Vulcanalia is believed to be put in August because that was a time of wildfires and droughts. And people thought that if they honoured the fire god at the time when they were most at risk of fires, then that might prevent them from actually breaking out in the first place. And this does actually come from the fact that a major part of the worship of Vulcan was essentially to avert fires, which does explain much of the Vulcanalia itself. So as an example, the Great Fire of Rome raged between the 18th and 23rd of July in 64 AD and ancient historians actually blamed Emperor Nero for the fire, though they claimed he wanted to destroy the city to build a new palace. Nero himself blamed the Christian community, thus starting a new wave of persecution against the Christians and other people saw the fire as being a message from Vulcan. So Domitian, the emperor after Nero, built a much bigger temple to Vulcan on the Quirinal Hill and expanded the annual sacrifices to include red bulls, just in the hope that Vulcan wouldn't start any more fires. So on the day of the Vulcanalia itself, the Romans would light huge bonfires outside of Rome's city limits to symbolise their control of fire, and they would make offerings to Vulcan by throwing fish and small animals into these bonfires, the idea being that sacrificing these items meant Vulcan would then spare the city or its grain stores. The Romans also held games to honour Vulcan, and trumpets were also sacred to the god, so the Romans would hold ceremonies to purify their trumpets. Pliny the Younger refers to a superstition in which people began their day's work by candlelight, which some people think was intended to remind Vulcan of his control over beneficial fire rather than destructive fire. Now, there is little evidence of this custom outside of Pliny's writing, so we don't know to what extent people actually practised it, though it would certainly make a lot of sense. And Virgil notes in the Iliad that Vulcan himself rises before dawn to tend his forge, so the timing might also be in his honour as well. By all accounts, it does sound like it was a much more peaceful festival than the Lupercalia in February or Saturnalia in December, yet its apotropaic functions make it an incredibly important festival. Now, if you would like to celebrate it yourself, and you can, then start your day with candlelight before dawn. Now, obviously, please do just remember to put any candles out before you leave the house and make sure that they're properly extinguished before you go out. You can bless any fireplaces, microwaves, ovens, grills, any kind of fiery household goods. I guess if you've got like an outdoor barbecue, you could bless that. All of these things fall under Vulcan's domain and you want them to keep working. You can also have grilled fish for dinner and set some of that aside for Vulcan. Although I would hazard to say that if you don't eat fish, and I certainly don't, then you could probably use biscuits in the shape of a fish as a substitute because obviously there is that link between the Vulcanalia and trying to protect grain. So ultimately, what do we make of this god? Well, there is very little written about how ordinary people actually worship gods on a day-to-day basis, which is annoying. But naturally, at home, people would actually appeal to Vesta over the hearth fire rather than Vulcan. But anyone who worked with fire in any capacity would no doubt offer prayers to Vulcan. Smiths and artisans in particular would ask for his aid, given his status as a supreme craftsman, but also the way that they needed to use fire in their work as well. 
And while he doesn't always come out of the myths well, I mean, you've got him ensnaring Venus and Mars in bed with a golden net. You've got him trapping Juno in the chair. Vulcan is usually responding to the way other people treat him. He doesn't really seem to be the instigator of any of these things. He's just sort of lashing out or defending himself or making someone else look stupid because they've made him look stupid first. He's not really depicted as being malicious either, and he usually diverts his immense creative intelligence into his work instead. And it is also, I think, quite easy for us to forget the fear that fire would instill in earlier peoples because obviously technology has largely brought fire under control. But it is worth remembering that it does still demand respect because a small spark can easily get out of control. So what I'd like to know is what do you make of Vulcan? Do you have the same fascination for Vulcan that I do? I don't know. Maybe you do. Be interesting to know. And please do feel free to let me know. Obviously, as always, you can post comments underneath the video. You can leave comments apparently on Spotify now, which is a bizarre thing because I can't actually reply to them. But there we go. You can leave comments on the blog post that this episode is associated with. And obviously all those links are in the show notes. Somebody did ask if we could have an episode on Epona, but I do actually have that as a bonus episode for Fabulous Folklore supporters on Patreon because I did a whole collection of Celtic deities. So if you are interested in learning more about Epona, then that is available if you become a supporter at the 350 a month or more limit. So hopefully that's helpful. And as I say, I haven't quite decided between Pomona or Minerva for next week. So if you tune in, you'll find out which one I chose. If you've got any requests for what you'd like to see for future episodes, as always, there is a link in the show notes to my requests form and you're more than welcome to put things in there. I can't guarantee that I will be able to fulfill requests because sometimes there just isn't any folklore associated with something or it just lies really far outside my remit, but I can at least still have a look. So it's worth asking, if nothing else. So I hope that you've enjoyed this episode and I'll see you next week when we'll be looking at either Pomona or Minerva. Cheerio. Well, thanks for listening and I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you did, feel free to leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts because that helps other people find the show too. It also takes between four and six hours to research, write, record and edit these episodes. So if you want to help support my time in doing that, then you can buy me a coffee or you can join the Fabulous Folklore family on Patreon and enjoy extra benefits, including exclusive episodes and articles and even illustrated talks. All the links you need are below and thanks in advance.